Okay, real briefly, uh, this video will cover many of the technical details in determining whether or not you will be able to build a ram pump given your situation. Uh, if you don't know what a ram pump is, we'll go into that. Uh, we'll go into how to take elevation measurements, how to take volume calculations, how to figure out what the best size ram pump for your situation is, how to correct for elevation. We're going to go into a whole bunch of stuff here, and then we'll go over some of the uh, uh, finer nuances of uh, ram pumps as it relates to practical application uh, regarding plumbing, uh, fittings, uh, types of pipe, um, uh, filtration, intake, standpipe setup, all that sort of stuff. So uh, this video is basically a technical manual so that you can understand how to design and implement a ram pump on your farm or homestead. Um, I've spent a lot of time playing with ram pumps and learning about them and I've done a couple different videos, well many different videos on them and a couple of them really took off so there seems to be some interest so I thought I would do uh, this video because I had a lot of questions along these lines and I thought I would just make one long video and cover it. All said and done I think this video is going to be about an hour and a half I apologize for the length, but I really wanted to be clear and specific on technical details. So I hope you'll bear with me if you're interested in this sort of thing and you want to build a ram pump. I hope this video will help. February 4th, 2020. So I've been promising to get back to this video for quite some time. This video is uh, basically uh, site selection and how you uh, measure and take calculations on a site to determine whether or not you can put a ram pump on a site and if you can what size ram pump you can put on and uh, and generally what its output will be how high it can pump what the volume will be all those sort of parameters so what is a ram pump a ram pump is a hydraulically a hydraulically operated pump basically uh, it uses a portion of the water that is falling from a water source to drive the pressure in the pump. Some of that pressure, or some of that energy is used and transferred uh, to build pressure in the pressure chamber. The pressure chamber side is the output side that delivers a small portion of the water that is being pumped through the ram pump to your destination. The rest of the water that's going through the pump is uh, wasted it's not actually wasted its energy is being used to pump the small portion of water up so a ram pump will typically pump about 10 times the fall distance so if you have water falling 10 feet and you have enough water to supply a ram pump uh, you can basically pump to 100 feet with a portion of that water and usually that runs somewhere around 10 to 15 percent of the total volume throughput of the pump I do have a video on calculating a ram pump's efficiency. Uh, perhaps I'll drop a link below, but you can check that out as well. So basically a ram pump is a hydraulically operated pump, and it uses an air pressure chamber to buffer the hydraulic shock that we're taking advantage of. Hydraulic uh, systems are systems that don't have any gas in them, and so the uh, fluid inside that system is virtually incompressible. Uh, water can be compressed, but it's such a small amount that it's not noticeable. And so instead of letting that shock be a detriment to the system, we take advantage of that hydraulic concept and we use it to pump a small portion of the water going through the pump. So that's basically what a ram pump is and how it works. Okay, so before we get too much deeper into uh, calculating ram pump stuff, uh, anytime you engineer or design something, you really want to understand the machine that you're trying to design and what what's involved in it. Uh, you really need to understand the specifics of it before you can really, you know, determine whether it's something you can do. So uh, I'm going to share this link here uh in this uh, below this video this is uh the clemson edu link on homemade hydraulic ram pumps this is by far the best manual that i've found to date and this is the one that i designed my ram pump from and this manual has a tremendous amount of excellent information in it um, 
So we should just go into some basic, uh, basic understanding of RAM pumps. So I'm going to read this to you, and then uh, we'll go from there. So this information is provided as a service to those who want to try to build their own hydraulic RAM pump. The data from our experiences with one of these homemade hydraulic RAM pumps is listed in Table 4 near the bottom of this document. The typical cost of fittings for a one and a quarter inch pump currently is $120 US, regardless of whether galvanized or PVC fittings are used. Uh, now this is an older manual, so the cost has gone up a bit due to material costs going up and inflation. This is the basic diagram of how a RAM pump works. Uh, I suppose we should go over that quickly. Um, well, we'll come back to that, I think. Um, Let's so they go into connections a little bit and uh, and using prop, pro, appropriate and uh, proper fittings and connections. Uh, let's see, uh, important pieces, pressure chamber, a uh, bicycle or scooter tire inner tube is placed inside the pressure chamber, uh, part 15, as an air bladder to prevent water logging or air logging. Inflate the tube until it is spongy when squeezed and then insert it in the chamber. It should not be inflated very tightly, but have some give to it. Basically, this is going to act as a, a shock absorber so that the pump doesn't tear itself apart. Um, uh, no information is available concerning pressure chamber sizes for various sizes of RAM pumps. Uh, make one for somewhat larger pumps. For instance, try a 6 inch diameter by 24 pressure chamber or for a 3 inch RAM. <clears throat> uh, I will say I have tried many different uh, chamber sizes and I found that the size of the chamber once you get to big enough to absorb shock doesn't matter much and it will not affect your pump delivery or anything so don't go crazy on building a chamber you probably don't need more than 4 inch diameter and 36 to 48 inches tall uh, unless you're building a massive ramp pump like in the 4 inch range or bigger or, or maybe even three inch you might get a little bit bigger but anything below that from two inches on down you can go down to pretty small if you're building a half inch or a three quarter inch or one inch ram you probably don't need much more than I don't know maybe a foot tall by three inches in diameter uh, I've tried all sorts of different stuff as shock absorbers I have not found anything that lasts long term I have not gone back and retried the uh, the bicycle inner tube. I think that is probably your best bet. Uh, but what I ended up doing was just, uh, you know, occasionally I drain the the pressure chamber out and let fresh air into it, and then I fill it back up and run it. And I find that runs for a couple of weeks uh, before it dies down. Ultimately, I want to put a snifter valve in, but that can be a little bit tricky because you have to drill a hole that lets just enough air in without compromising the efficiency of your pump and I've been a little hesitant to do that since the pump works so well. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, they talk about using a, they tried to use a four inch threaded plug for this uh, pressure chamber so they could get it open and closed. They found that this combination leaked regardless of how tightly it was tightened or how much Teflon tape they used in the seal. Uh, which results in uh, if you have a leak in the pressure chamber the pressure chamber water logs out quickly and then your ram pump doesn't run as efficiently and it will tear itself apart because now all that shock is being put on every piece of that pipe one thing with hydraulics uh, the pressure that you put into a hydraulic system is uniform across the system so if you have a uh, water shock or water hammer situation in the system that shock is being distributed to the entire system at the same time um, so they say this in turn increased the shock waves and could possibly have shortened pump life um, and they say if the bicycle tube should need to be serviced when using the glue when using the glue cap the pipe may be cut in half and then you can re-glue them with a coupling I don't like doing that I did find a way around the threaded plug issue I do recommend you use a threaded plug except I would get some silicon sealant like you use for aquariums and I'd put that on the threads of the plug and I'd thread the plug in and I'd let that sit 24 hours at room temperature to dry or cure and then I found that that kept it from leaking and it made it so that you could open it up later on with a you know a pair of uh, channel locks or a big pipe wrench you could get that cap back off but that maintains your seal uh, so that was how I got around that issue um, 
Let's see. So valve number one is uh, drive inlet for the water pump. Let's go back and look at this diagram quick here. Uh, so this is an on-off valve basically. And uh, this here is a check valve. And this here is a check valve. This check valve is run reverse. So as water flows down the pipe, it pushes the check valve until it slams shut. When this check valve slams shut, that forces through the water shock, that forces this check valve open and lets a portion of the water out and into the pressure chamber. That water fills into the pressure chamber. There's air space in here, say from like here or so, and that water fills into the pressure chamber because the air allows it to. Um, when the equilibrium between this pressure and this pressure is met, then this valve closes and it holds that pressure in there. And then you're letting that pressure out um, slowly over time, basically, out through your delivery line. And this cycle will keep repeating itself. This valve will fall back due to gravity once there's no pressure holding it. And when it does, it'll open up, water will start to flow again, and it'll come through. It'll slam this valve shut again. That'll push this open again, push another portion of water in, and the cycle continues. So that's how that works. That's basic understanding. <coughs> um, let's see, they get into some pretty uh, in-depth information in here. Uh, one thing we do have to cover is drive pipe. So these calculations, these numbers right here, are excellent for calculating drive pipe length. So let's just, oh boy, if I can find a calculator. Okay, real briefly, I want to touch on the drive pipe of the ram pump. Uh, the drive pipe of the ram pump is the water inlet side going to the pump. Uh, that usually either comes from your water source directly or comes from your standpipe, depending on uh, the logistics involved in, in your system and the terrain that you're working in. But basically, the drive pipe is the water flowing into the pump. That drive pipe should not have any air in it so that you don't have any place for the water to compress except through the valves that are in the pump. And uh, that, that water in that drive pipe is effectively acting as a sledgehammer. And so just to help you visualize this concept a little more, if you have a 20 foot long pipe full of water uh, that has a certain amount of weight and mass to it and that's moving in inertia in each cycle of the pump. If you have a 40 foot pipe that's the equivalent of double the amount of water in there and it's basically double the sledgehammer that's driving that initial valve in the pump and so you have more energy available in there. Um, but there are some limitations to that. We'll get into that in another clip. All right, let's talk about shock wave and refraction wave in a ram pump. So in a ram pump, when water, when the, when the primary, the impetus valve opens, water starts to flow down your drive pipe. And as it flows, it picks up speed. And as it picks up enough speed, it eventually picks up enough speed that it catches that check valve and slams that check valve shut. When that happens, there are actually two way, two waves that happen there. There's a pressure wave that happens immediately when that valve closes. All that moving inertia and water behind that valve is forced to come to a stop. That causes a tremendous pressure spike. That's what opens the secondary valve and lets a portion of the water through. But right after that, there's something called the refraction wave that happens. And that refraction wave is sort of a it's sort of the opposite of the pressure wave and that travels back up that drive pipe and that'll either go back to the water source or back to the standpipe depending on your setup and if that refraction wave is hindered uh, you'll end up where your valve won't pop back open so basically the ram pump the, the water in the drive pipe flows down the drive pipe faster and faster until the drive pipe, until the impetus valve is forced close. At that point, there's a huge pressure spike that pushes open the secondary valve and lets some portion of the water through. At the same time that's happening, this refraction wave starts its way back up. And so the valve's opened, it, 
it it pushes the other valve open and lets some water out. We reach equilibrium. The secondary valve comes closed because there's nothing, no resistance now pushing it open, no pressure holding it open. And once that equilibrium is reached, this refraction wave goes back up the pipe. So this is part of why if you have a ramp pump with a drive pipe that is too long, you'll end up where the refraction wave will end up meeting the pressure wave and they'll start to cancel each other out. So that's why it's really important that you don't exceed uh, the maximum drive pipe length on a ram pump or you'll basically just cancel the pump's operation and you won't pump any water. So I just wanted to explain that little detail uh, to hopefully help you visualize a little better. If I can find a decent image or something to help you understand that better, I'll put it up here.